Our next speaker will be Dr. Michael Mishnah. Mike is the supervisor of the Earth and Planetary Atmospheres Group at JPL. In addition, he served as the acting deputy chief scientist of JPL Solar System Exploration Directorate. And he is a member of the entry, descent, and landing team for both the Mars 2020 and the InSight missions. Among Mike's many recognitions are JPL's prestigious Mariner and Lou Allen Awards, as well as NASA's Early Career Ach Achievement Medal. He is one of the few experts in the world studying Mars climate evolution over geological timescales. So we're very fortunate today to have Mike come here and tell us about atmospheric dynamics and climate history on Mars. I was tasked with speaking about a, a rather large uh, section of, of Mars science, and not only um, two topics really, the first atmospheric dynamics, so talking about the, the present day atmosphere of Mars and how the, the atmosphere moves, uh, as well as the uh, other part of Martian history, um, the other four and a half billion years, Martian climate history. So we're going to be spanning a large uh, range of time here in, in the talk that I have. Um, so because I am, am talking about four and a half billion years, I will probably omit one or two details about, uh, about Mars, but uh, I hope you'll forgive me and I'm happy to answer questions uh, that you have uh, later on. So let's uh, turn first to the present day to Mars atmospheric dynamics. Now, what I am going to talk to you today about uh, is a, a, an overview of the atmosphere that's geared towards the scientist or engineer, uh, which I think most of us here are, uh, that may be familiar with the physical principles of, of atmospheres, but may not be familiar with the uh, properties of the Martian atmosphere or atmospheric circulation. Or perhaps you are and just need a, a brief refresher. Uh, this will be geared with a slant towards how the atmosphere is influencing methane production, transport, and decay. And I'll really focus mostly on the transport aspect of things uh, and leave the, the production and decay mechanisms to the other uh, short courses and then other uh, discussions we have uh, during this, this course. What I hope to do is address uh, some of the uh, fairly dominant fields in, in the atmosphere. So looking at uh, atmospheric temperature, pressure, winds, and dust. Uh, and this will of course be sort of an abbreviated version of a longer talk that I give, but um, uh, hopefully fairly comprehensive. Uh, comparing the atmospheres of Mars and Earth uh, shows that they are uh, very different in a number of critical ways. Uh, of course, the atmosphere of Mars, as we know, is mostly CO2, and that differs significantly from Earth. Uh, there is virtually no water to speak of in the uh, Martian atmosphere, at least relative to Earth, where you can have upwards of a few percent uh, water vapor in the atmosphere. That has implications for the types and, and abundance of things like clouds in the atmosphere uh, and the way the atmosphere is heated. Uh, on Mars versus the Earth. The surface pressure is about 1% as thick as, as Earth's surface pressure. And the surface temperatures are uh, substantially cooler than Earth, perhaps not surprisingly, being that Mars is, is further away from the Sun than the Earth. Uh, both planets have polar caps made of water ice, mostly. Here's an uh, uh, indication of, of these polar caps on Mars and some clouds that are, are surrounding those caps. Uh, and then the, the length of the year on Mars is not quite twice as long as it is on Earth. However, despite these rather substantial differences in, in the atmospheres of the two planets, the dynamics behind the planets, the way the atmospheres move, uh, is actually rather similar. And I've shown here a few examples of some rather dramatic uh, types of atmospheric motions and, and atmospheric features. Here, of course, is Earth, and we see very coherent cloud-like structures that cover uh, up to a third of the planetary surface. A uh, very nice example of a, a baroclinic uh, cyclone storm here in the, the Midwest of the US. And then over Scotland, uh, some nice gravity waves we see uh, in the cloud structures. Uh, on Mars, we actually see many of the sim same types of features here is the North Pole of Mars, the North Polar Cap, but we see lots of cloud cover uh, that's present uh, during, uh, during this time. Uh, examples of these baroclinic storms, uh, waves, gravity waves that are being forced by topography on the surface. So uh, when we 
talk about the Martian atmosphere, and we'll be talk showing some results of models, for example, uh, numerical climate models. These models are not made out of thin air for Mars, but they're actually derived from similar models that we use for Earth. They're adapted for use on Mars, but most of the adaptations have to do with the <coughs> physics uh, or sort of the physical parameters of the atmosphere, the composition, uh, the gravity of Mars, uh, specific heat of Mars, things like that. The dynamics and the equations of motion are one and the same between the two planets. All right, so let's turn to the first uh, field here, surface pressure. Uh, as I noted, because of the distance uh, from the sun and the composition of the Martian atmosphere, the atmosphere itself is going to freeze out. The CO2, uh, the temperatures get so cold that the CO2 in the atmosphere actually freezes out. And here's a, a nice image showing uh, the condensed form of CO2 in the North Polar region here uh, at, at, um, during the northern winter. Here's a corresponding example in the southern winter. You can see that you get a very large uh, deposit of CO2 ice that forms on the surface. And it causes substantial variations in the Martian surface pressure over the course of the year, upwards of 25 to 30 percent. Now looking down from the south pole, this is what we refer to as the residual cap. This is made mostly of water ice with a thin veneer of CO2 uh, that lasts throughout the year. But as you move into southern winter, the size of this cap grows rather substantially, right? And you can see just how much uh, CO2 ice is, is forming in a seasonal time scale. Once you get into spring and then summer, most of this CO2 or most of this CO2 then returns back to the atmosphere. And you get this sort of oscillatory sloshing motion is how I like to think of it, of CO2 from one hemisphere, one pole to the other over the course of the year. And the consequence then for uh, the atmospheric pressure of this uh, condensation cycle is something that looks like this. Now this is data from the MSL spacecraft, uh, which is showing time, either as, as season or L sub S value. And then here is the Sol number of the, the MSL mission. Uh, and we're looking at surface pressure. You can see that between sort of this low point here and this high point here, and this corresponds to a solstice season, and then an equinox is about 25%. It's a couple hundred pascal or a couple millibars. This is, of course, at uh, Gale Crater, but the same general pattern holds anywhere on the planet. You get two of these peaks and valleys, each one corresponding to a solstice season in the south or in the north, and then the equinox seasons over here. The other thing to note uh, of interest for surface pressure is that the width of one of these curves, for example, is about 10 percent. And that means that on uh, each of these dots, I should note, each of these blue dots here represents a single measurement by the instrument. And the day to night variation in surface pressure is rather substantial. It's about upwards of 10 to 12 percent uh, of the, the pressure cycle varies over the course of the day. So you have very significant changes in uh, surface pressure, both in a global scale and also on a local scale. And that will have consequences for how um, uh, releases of gas, I, I always use methane as this example here, might uh, move and evolve over the course of the day and of the season, depending on where the pressure cycles are driving, uh, driving your atmosphere. The other thing to note is the second year, which is where we, we're currently sort of around here, but the red dots uh, for the available data we have show that it's very repetitive year after year. So this is a, a very repetitive cycle, just, just like on the Earth for the most part. OK, temperature. Um, here we've got the, the temperature range for Earth and for Mars. And both planets, you can actually get liquid water or have the potential for liquid water from a temperature constraint <coughs> point of view, although it's much more restrictive for Mars. The lower temperature for Mars corresponds to the frost point temperature of CO2. So the temperatures, once they get this cold and the CO2 starts to freeze out, releases latent heat, and that keeps the planet in, in equilibrium. <coughs> Um, so that this is sort of the global perspective of temperature. For a single point on the surface, though, uh, the, the temperature structure, the vertical temperature structure, would look something like this. Now, this is uh, actually data from a model that I ran. For a single point, I just chose arbitrarily near the equator for a single day in, in midsummer. And each, uh, each frame here is representing one hour of time over the day.
I want you to focus on this region down here, which is what we refer to as the, the boundary layer. This is the area of the atmosphere which is interacting directly with the Martian surface. And what you'll notice is that the, the rate at which this temperature goes up and then goes down is very fast. In the course of just a couple hours, you can get temperature changes of 50 to 60 uh, degrees C uh, right at the surface. And the reason for this is that unlike on the Earth, where the atmosphere itself is capable of, of absorbing sunlight and heating itself, uh, either from gaseous absorption or from the presence of, of clouds or other aerosols, um, on Mars, the atmosphere is largely transparent to visible light. So most of the incoming solar radiation gets to the surface and is absorbed or reflected by the surface. When that surface heats up, it emits in the infrared, and that is the radiation that is absorbed by the atmosphere. So um, there's a strong coupling between the surface and the atmospheric temperatures, which is why you see, for example, here, a very sharp uh, rise and then very sharp fall right near the surface. Because essentially, whatever the temperature of the surface is, is going to be reflected in what the temperature of the near surface uh, atmosphere is going to be. Everything within this boundary layer is going to be very well mixed over relatively short time scales, over the course of a day, for example. Um, what happens is, as the surface is heating up, and begins to heat the atmosphere, you get overturning and convection, a little bit of turbulence, and all of that motion, that small scale motion, starts to build as the day goes on until you get this real convective motion in the lower roughly 10 kilometers of the atmosphere. So signals that are released from the surface of, of Mars are going to be fairly well mixed in the matter of just a couple of days. So I, I always keep that in mind when I think about these putative, uh, putative methane detections, something that's released at the surface, how quickly is it going to be mixed and dispersed uh, uh, from, from the surface? And so this turbulence that I was describing here can be you know, maybe seen slightly better in, in, in a, a figure like this, which is showing time of day and altitude. This is two, two separate days for a, a model run that I have. The colors reflect the amount of convective or this turbulent energy that, that I'm talking about. Uh, if you start at nighttime, at midnight, as you're proceeding through the day, the atmosphere is very cold. It's very stable. So things that are released into the atmosphere tend to remain where they are, and they, don't, they are not um, uh, unstably moved elsewhere. But once the sun starts to rise around 9 AM, um, you begin to get that heating of the surface heats the atmosphere, you get this mixing. And you can see from the warmer colors that this mixing begins to grow in magnitude and in height. And pretty much the entire boundary layer, up to about 10 kilometers, sees signals that are, are initially released very near the surface. Once you get, though, to about 6 PM, around 1,800 hours, the sun sets, whew, everything falls down back to this very stable condition uh, on Mars throughout the rest of the night. And just two, two days here. Uh, uh, of this particular simulation. But you see how you get this growth, a very unstable convective motion, and then it all comes crashing back down to a very stable uh, condition. So this type of, of motion, the movement of air, leads me into the next topic, which is wind and circulation. Um, the, the global circulation on Mars is actually very similar in, in most respects to the global circulation uh, on the Earth. It's largely controlled by uh, these Hadley cells, the Hadley circulation, which is what we experience here on Earth. It's a thermally direct overturning circulation where uh, an imbalance in heating between two places on the planet, so the equator and then the mid-latitudes, causes rising of air where it's warmer. And then you get the cellular motion, which cools the air where it sinks in the higher latitudes. And then r the return flow brings you back to where you started from. And, and uh, here's an example for, for Earth, but essentially for Mars as well, of these Hadley cells uh, that are bringing your, your air, circulating your air around. Here is some uh, modeling results from uh, Francois Forger. This is a, a seminal paper, that, a modeling paper that he had done about 15 years ago with uh, his French colleagues, which shows um, what's referred to as the mass stream function. And if you're not familiar with what that is, think of it in the sense that these contours and this is latitude versus height. These contours show the path that parcels of the, the atmosphere would take uh, along their sort of trajectory. So you'll see there are all a lot of these are closed loops. So you can think of the atmosphere as sort of following 
in these closed loops. I'm showing these results for the four cardinal seasons of northern spring, northern summer, northern autumn, and northern winter, and a, a rough estimate of where the sun would be located overhead. And you can see during equinox, when the sun is over the equator, their model shows you get these two sort of symmetric cells, roughly symmetric cells, uh, about the equator. In summertime, though, now your sun is all the way, well, it's, it's probably it's around 23 degrees north. I exaggerated a bit, but it's further in the northern hemisphere. So your warmer air is in the northern hemisphere. And that causes the growth of a much larger dominant single cell uh, circulation. So that's bringing at the surface air from the southern hemisphere towards the northern hemisphere. Now at the other equinox, it's basically the same thing uh, as before. But then when you get to uh, southern winter, get rising in the south, uh, sorry, southern summer, northern winter, you get rising in the south, sinking in the north, and a general trend of, of atmospheric motion near the surface pushing you from the north to the south. So then uh, you think in, in sort of the global sense that the atmosphere is moving in one direction and then in the other direction uh, over the course of the year. Here we go. OK, so imprinted upon this global scale circulation are a lot of more localized circulations uh, on Mars that are controlled by uh, things such as topography, which is what, something we see strongly on Earth. Thermal contrasts, things like the presence of ice at the poles adjacent to darker sandy regions or darker uh, ice-free regions, uh, and other albedo and thermal inertia variations. These types of thermal contrasts can actually induce um, circulations. We're familiar with them on Earth as sea breezes and land breezes and things like that. And then the presence of dust in the atmosphere, which I have not touched on yet, is also going to be a strong modifier of the, the general or global circulation. Uh, topography is responsible for generating waves in the atmosphere and also for restricting some wind patterns. Remember that topography on Mars is vastly larger in scale than it is on Earth. So things that we, um, uh, things that we would not as assume occur here on Earth and which don't occur on Earth, actually um, uh, we do see on Mars. Olympus Mons, for example, is immense. It, it goes all the way through the troposphere, basically, and so is going to ref restrict the, the circulatory motions uh, of the atmosphere as it's passing over or around, um, trying to go around uh, this type of topography. Slope winds, just briefly, we, um, we see this on Earth. If you live in, a, in an area on a, in a valley somewhere, you'll, you'll definitely detect this. And at Gale Crater, we're seeing this uh, quite clearly. During the daytime, the air is heated, and this less buoyant, warm air rises up the valley walls, and then at night, as it becomes colder, it all kind of slopes back down and pools at the base of, of the valley. So we see this strongly uh, on Mars as well, and it's something that we, we often um, need to account for in our modeling. OK, moving right along to atmospheric dust. Um, it's a, a very important component of the atmosphere. It's very coherently structured. These large scale uh, dust storms, which crop up now and again, uh, impact the, the most of the atmosphere uh, near the surface. This is, I think, Opportunity, a, a, a selfie from Opportunity, which shows that the, the sedimentation of dust, the falling of dust, uh, is so significant so as to make the, the spacecraft virtually indistinguishable from the background. So dust really plays an important role in the atmosphere. At larger scales, most of the major circulation components will, strength, will be strengthened by the presence of dust. Um, you can think about these global circulations as sort of a, a, a battle of, of a, a thermal contrast. You've got warm air, you've got cold air, and the, you're trying to, uh, your strongest winds and your circulation is going to be controlled by that thermal contrast. Now, when you introduce dust into the atmosphere uh, of Mars, for example, it's ubiquitous. These global dust storms literally cover the entire planet. What that has the effect of doing is pushing that thermal contrast much further towards the poles, because the dust in the atmosphere just warms the atmosphere. It absorbs sunlight. It then re-radiates and heats that atmosphere. So that thermal contrast is pushed much closer to the poles. So you get much more intense, larger circulations in these global dust storms. Uh, 
In contrast, local circulations, things that occur near the surface, so these slope flows, these, these um, um, uh, perhaps these, these um, albedo variations or these, uh, those types of circulations are going to be weakened by the same effect. And that's because the dust that's in the atmosphere is doing a good job warming the atmosphere, but it's also sucking up all that sunlight from reaching the surface. So you get less intense sunlight at the surface and less energy, basically, to drive atmospheric circulations. So we can think about this in the context of, of methane, for example, or any, any trace gas that, or something that's released from the surface is in years that are very dusty versus years that are, are rather clear, you will have a potentially different type of circulation that is impacting where this, uh, this signal would be uh, moved around on the surface. OK, so, to, so to summarize, um, temperature largely controlled by the surface, not the atmosphere. Uh, there is a, a stable, unstable dichotomy in the atmosphere from day to night, and ample mixing, is especially near the surface in the boundary layer. Um, the pressure cycle, there's the seasonal condensation cycle responsible for a 25 to 30 percent variation in surface pressure. Something I didn't mention is that when you condense out the CO2, all of your non-condensable gases, nitrogen, argon, methane, uh, will be enriched, will be correspondingly enriched. Now, methane is not really a, an issue here because it's so much smaller, but we see this signal actually in, in the argon measurements, for example. Uh, dust affects the strength of your global circulation. I didn't talk about the potential chemistry effects. I think we'll hear about this a little bit later, but dust may actually play a role in the, the destruction of, of methane. Some people in, in the audience here, Franck, uh, has worked on uh, on this, this problem along with Francois Forget. And then wind, multiple scales, global, local. Uh, you'll tend to get global mixing in the atmosphere on the order of about 30 days. So any signal that's released into the atmosphere should be indistinguishable uh, after no more than about 30 days. And then the global circulation is strongly affected by your local conditions. OK, so I covered briefly the, the present day atmosphere. And now I dive into the other 4.4999999 billion years, uh, trying to summarize that as best I can. There will be a bit of overlap with what Bethany spoke about, hopefully not too much, because I'm not talking strictly about the water. Um, but the, the, there is very compelling geological and geochemical evidence that points to a vastly different early climate on Mars. Uh, there's a lot of indications of things, fluvial features, things like rivers, channels, and shorelines, uh, aqueous minerals, and other signatures uh, on the surface that suggest the, the planet had to be warmer and wetter than at the present. Um, likely, it had an atmosphere on the order of hundreds of millibars of pressure versus the six millibars we have today. And it would have required temperatures near or above the melting point of fresh water in order for that, that water to exist. Uh, so how did we get from a planet that might have looked like this and had features that looked like that or like that into something that looked, looks today like this? Where did this water go? Where did the heating and the warmth go? Now, this is one of the big outstanding uh, questions uh, in, in, uh, in Mars atmospheric science. And so for the next seven minutes, I'll try to highlight some of the thinking that's gone into how you could have gotten Mars warm early on and still, still maintained the, the present day state that, that we see here. So we know the atmosphere had to be thicker because of these constraints on, of liquid water has on pressure and temperature. You need to be above the triple point temperature, uh, of course, for water, but you also need to be above the triple point pressure. Uh, presently on Mars, uh, you're right at that hairy edge where the, the northern hemisphere is actually above the triple point pressure for water. The southern hemisphere is generally not. Um, but if you step back through time, if you had a sl even a slightly thicker atmosphere, much more of the surface would have been of opened to the, the possible presence of transient liquid water, at least, if not uh, more sustained liquid water. The big problem that we face is that you can't simply crank up the amount of greenhouse gases that, uh, that you have in order to get your planet warmer. Uh, so simply because the early sun was probably 25 to 30 percent less luminous than it is today. So you're already starting from a, a much colder place. Uh, and this is what we refer to as the faint young sun paradox. How did Mars, how did early Mars, which was much, which was warmer than today, come about with a sun that was less bright? 
And uh, the question, can it be reconciled, is, is still probably, I think, is the answer to it. Uh, perhaps an easy way to, you know, uh, back of the envelope calculation would be, what if we were j to just add more CO2 to the atmosphere? Well, people had done this and said it would take about five bars of CO2 in the atmosphere to, you know, at, at the greenhouse um, uh, uh, ability of, of, of CO2 to get your planet to about 273 Kelvin or zero, uh, zero Celsius. The problem, though, is that CO2 will actually saturate in the atmosphere at pressures lower than this. So just like water condenses and saturates in our atmosphere, the CO2 would saturate in the Martian atmosphere. And you could never really get to five bars in the first place. And furthermore, as you increase the amount of CO2 in your atmosphere, you actually increase dramatically the amount of Rayleigh scattering, so scattering of sunlight out of the atmosphere. And that brightens your planet substantially. Uh, so CO2 may actually start to cool the planet rather than warm the planet. So CO2, although we think of it as a greenhouse warmer, it may not always be that, uh, that case. It may actually uh, cool the planet. So other avenues were pursued, uh, even though we s people still assume that CO2 was abundant in some am amount long ago. We started looking at other greenhouse species, uh, ammonia, sulfur dioxide, methane, and so on and so on. And what if you were to put these gases in the atmosphere, perhaps introduced from volcanic activity, from ex, you know, external sources maybe? Um, each of them, unfortunately, has a drawback of some sort. And you can almost one-to-one -one trace some of these drawbacks to individual species. But certain gases are too highly soluble. Uh, the redox chemistry may not work out. Photochemical lifetimes of some of these gases may be brief. Uh, you need a very large abundance in order to get uh, a lot of warming on the planet, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's been a very challenging process, but people uh, uh, have run climate models to try to understand how much warming you can get, and selfishly uh, self-promoting myself here. Uh, this is a work that I did just as an example of, of this type of uh, the effects that these trace gases could have. This is latitude versus longitude for four different simulations with, uh, with a climate model. If you just have 500 millibars of CO2, you get a surface annual average surface temperature that's like this. The blue and green colors correspond to you know, 220 to 240 Kelvin, so not very warm. As you do things like add water vapor to saturate your atmosphere, you get a little better. You add sulfur dioxide to the atmosphere, you get even better. And then if you mix all of those together in a giant cauldron uh, of the atmosphere, maybe then you can start to get these temperatures that approach where you might need to go in order to see liquid water on the surface. But it's, it's still a, somewhat of a hand-wavy argument. It, a lot of, of issues with this and other, uh, other cases. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. When you show annual average surface yeah. temperatures, that, is, that includes nighttime temperatures? So it means during the day it's getting warmer, or is that only daytime? You're absolutely right. So this is, this is at total diurnal annual average. So daytime temperatures would be, would be warmer. Perhaps by a significant amount. Um, yeah. Why do you say that? I'm sorry? Oh. I mean, after you make the, after you make the big greenhouse, the diurnal temperature variability is a lot smaller. That's true, too. But the, the day versus nighttime temperatures, uh, you would still have. This is showing the, the annual average temperature. And so I, I, I guess the way I was answering Bethany's question was that to get liquid water, you don't need to have temperatures above 273 perpetually. It only needs to be you know, even a few hours a day. So I, kind of making that point here is that this is overkill for what you would need to even start to melt, melt water on the surface. Um, another example, uh, which I'm sort of running out of time on, but this is a, a case that uh, Ramses Ramirez and, and Jim Casting, my former, or my graduate advisor, uh, worked up where you might actually find that hydrogen gas in a CO2 atmosphere could get you uh, above the freezing point of water. So it's a surface pressure and temperature. And if you were to get to 273K for an a sun, a faint young sun of about 75% of today's value, these blue curves correspond to the order of, you know, was that about a, a bar or thereabouts? But you're talking a 20% hydrogen atmosphere. Um, who knows whether that's really something that we should expect uh, any time other than the very origins of the, uh, the planet's formation. Um, cloud cover. Clouds are also going to be a, an important uh, uh, greenhouse, potential greenhouse warmer. Water ice clouds. 
CO2 ice clouds, they can both potentially be warming agents due to uh, uh, either absorption and re-emission or scattering of infrared radiation. What I'm illustrating here, you don't need to know what the simulations that were gener generated these panels were for, but if you increase the amount of cloud as we move to the right, you make these clouds higher, you make the cloud particles bigger, you can get more warming. And, and in the case where all of these were pushed to the extreme, you can actually get temperatures around the melting point of water. Uh, it's actually a very similar process to what we see with cirrus clouds on Earth. Um, so tying things up then, uh, looking outside of the planet, impact warming, impact-induced warming, might be a mechanism to get the planet uh, warm enough for liquid water. Uh, you introduce a lot of heat and water to the climate, but it requires big impactors. Uh, and that's going to result in a global influence. So you should expect to see sort of the global reaches of this type of, of uh, uh, event. And furthermore, the large impacts that you need, 10 kilometers in size or more, become much less frequent as you move through history. So the, the frequency of occurrence of this type of warming mechanism is probably uh, going to be greatly diminished as we move out of the, um, out of the Noachian. Um, a paper that came out just a couple weeks ago by, um, by Ren Yu Hu and, and Bethany Elman and other colleagues uh, suggest that perhaps uh, simple atmospheric sputtering, non-thermal uh, uh, sputtering and moderate carbonate formation could serve as a means to decay your atmosphere from this warmer, thicker CO2. Um, from this figure, disregard these gray panels, but I just wanted to point out here in their model, they suggested that on the order of a couple hundred millibars of atmosphere could have been lost due to sputtering. So nothing creative, nothing really inventive other than you had a CO2 atmosphere that was being eroded uh, out to space. And you can wind up with uh, sort of the present day amount of, of CO2 uh, at the, the surface with an atmosphere that started out uh, you know, at least at 3.8 billion years ago on the order of a quarter to maybe a half or, or certainly less than one bar of CO2 and would have led you to probably less than 100 millibars since 3 billion years ago. Uh, and then mostly cold and dry throughout history. You know, you're, you're pretty much where you are today throughout much of history. Um, I think Bethany spoke about orbital change. I'm going to kind of bypass um, my mention of orbital change, but this is a significant driver of climate in the very recent past on Mars. Uh, and just touch now on this other question that's been brought up before, I'm sure, is that maybe you don't need to get to 273K, right? You only need to get near 273K. And the presence of salts on the surface may help you to get liquid there for a sort of depressed surface um, uh, temperature. This is a, a paper now 10 years old, almost certainly out, uh, a bit outdated, but it shows the presence of a number of hydrated salts, magnesium sulfates and calcium sulfates, in, in different regions uh, of the surface that were identified. And each of these is going to allow you to potentially have a liquid, not fresh water, but a liquid water, salty brine, uh, present at the surface for temperatures maybe 10 or 20, or in cases of perchlorate salt, maybe as low as 70 degrees below zero C. So then my final slide to summarize, um, geochemical and geological evidence suggests a wetter and warmer early Mars. Uh, we need to significantly warm early Mars, or conversely, we need to find a way to get a warmer early Mars colder and drier today. And this is that faint young sun paradox that I mentioned. And many mechanisms have been proposed. I touched on, on a number of them. Uh, none of them are wholly satisfactory. I'm very s slowly coming about to the idea that they are all probably important in some way at some time, and that the, the true solution to getting a warm early Mars is going to be a little bit from column A and a little bit of, from column B. But I think uh, the last point I'll make is that I, most prevailing theories today are estimating in the order of maybe 100 or hundreds of millibars of CO2. So a, an atmosphere that was probably a couple orders of magnitude thicker than it was today, and that's been eroded. And the, the warming that we were seeing is probably coming about from a combination of volcanic activity, impacts, uh, briny salt solutions, and uh, a number of other mechanisms which we haven't had time to talk about today. Uh, so uh, I'll leave it at that, and thank you very much for your attention.